Thank you very much for inviting me. I am a lecturer in medical sociology at uh, Lancaster Medical School uh, and the work I'm presenting today comes from research I did some time ago now with Professor Imogen Tyler on her Rethinking the Sociology of Stigma project back in 2016 and Imogen's now published her book uh, on that project, Stigma, uh, the Machinery of Inequality. And that outlines the political function of stigma as an instrument of state coercion. My focus here is on the cultural and political economy of stigma and anti-stigma in mental health, drawing on a chapter I wrote for this excellent collection of writing entitled Madness, Violence and Power, edited by Andrea Daly, Lucy Costa and Peter Beresford. Um, so let's dig straight, straight in. Uh, so as we probably all know, the most famous work on stigma is by American sociologist Irvin Goffman, who published Stigma Notes on the Management of a Spoiled Identity in 1963. Um, for Goffman and the huge amount of stigma research and writing that's followed, stigma is the notion of a person being marked and devalued, their identity being spoiled in public, indicating that they've reached the social and moral order in some way. Uh, and the project I worked on with Imogen began with so outlining some of the issues with this, with Goffman's conceptualization of stigma, in that it focuses heavily on the moral career of the stigmatized and how stigmatized individuals negotiate that stigma. In turn, work inspired by him continues to research how groups of people are stigmatized and live with that stigma. So, for example, we might get a group of people with a mental illness diagnosis together to explore how their diagnosis um, has, has led to them feeling stigmatized and how they deal with that. Similarly, anti-stigma campaigns in mental health rely heavily on personal narratives. And this does very little to address the cultural and political economy of stigma as a form of power and a means of oppression that benefits certain sectors of society over others. So in this paper, I'm going to consider the mechanisms of stigma production in mental health with a specific focus on media, madness, violence and power. And there's a couple of perspectives that I'll explore. And the first one is the idea that the media are stigmatizing. So in 1996, Greg Filo and the Glasgow Media Group published Media and Mental Distress, reporting the findings of the first major study in the United Kingdom on media coverage of mental health and or illness. This research examined both the contents of press, television and films and other, uh, and other media, no, just press, television and films, and how these related to public beliefs about mental illness. It involved extensive content analysis and a series of focus groups um, with members of the public, general public, mental health service users and their carers and their family members. And the research was developed in collaboration with Health Scotland, the Royal College of Psychiatrists and Survivors Speak Out. They found that the media does play a role in perpetuating the myth that mentally ill people, especially those diagnosed with schizophrenia, were more prone to violence uh, than others. So the focus was on negative images on the headline front page news and positive items on the back page pages uh, with less exposure. So in light of these findings, they proposed that Persistently inaccurate media presentations and mental illness need to be changed by the development of guidelines for journalists and other media makers because they were undermining the success of care in the community and preventing people from seeking help from mental health services. And this wasn't the only type of this research. Other global North countries also really reached the same conclusion through the same kind of analysis, such as the work of Otto Wall in um, Canada. So the premise of these guidelines is that if we promote facts about mental illness, we will correct what they construe as inaccuracies in media representations. For example, in addressing the association of violence with mental illness, the following uh, and scare quotes around this fact about violence and mental health is widely circulated, as we can see on the time, this screen grab I've taken from time, the Time to Change website. And this fact is over a third of the public think people with mental health problems are likely to be violent. In fact, people with severe mental illnesses are more likely to be victims rather than perpetrators of violent crime. 
Underpinning this approach is a firm belief that once media representations adhere to the facts, any stigma about mental health will magically disappear. There are several problems with this research that need highlighting given their predominance concerning media violence and madness. First, these work within a media effects paradigm in which the media are understood to cause effects in the general public. <clears throat> Excuse me. David Gauntlet has helpfully outlined a long list of problems with this idea. Primarily, studies such as this approach social problems in a back to front way. They identify a problem, the stigma of, stigma of mental illness, and then attempt to prove that the media are to blame through and in this case, through misrepresentations of the facts. The media effects model works with a concept of individuals taken from psychology that treats people as inadequate and incapable of doing anything but accepting the intended meaning of any media message. These kinds of media analyses are easily put to service in concert, in, into service for conservative campaigns for more control of media. Uh, in this case, positioning positioning medical professions and mental health charities as the experts who would control and inform media messages about mental health and illness. The result of such anti-stigma work is that the objects of inquiry, and for this analysis, these are stigma, violence and mental illness, remain discreet, predefined and decontextualized. Mental health and illness remain within the confines of psychiatry and psychology, and their definitions, knowledge, experience, uh, expertise and practices, whilst violence is defined as an individual physical violence with one victim and one perpetrator. But what we count as violence and madness really matters here. In this construction, some kinds of violence and some kinds of madness are understood to be problematic, while others are not. And as David Harper has observed, this um, equation of violence with Immorality ignores both the violence of social oppression and the possibilities of violence as a legitimate response to it. Neither violence nor madness are individual, they're relational phenomena. They cannot be reduced to physical and biological things, but must be understood as social, political, cultural and institutional. In rethinking madness and violence in this way, we can reveal everyday processes of normalization, legitimization, and the ideological and economic interests implicit in the madness, violence, stigma, nexus. And returning to the example of the Glasgow Media Group study that I began with, I'd like to note how it's particularly interesting because they did a lot of work to move away from an a simplistic explanation of cause and effect to an analysis that attends to the complexity of belief formation between audiences and media. They did it with that methodology of content analysis, focus groups, interviews, um, but nevertheless, they arrive at the same conclusion as much less sophisticated research in this area also does, that the media must change and be more tightly controlled through codes of conduct. And in their literature review and the findings of their empirical study, they highlight a particular ambivalence in public beliefs about mental illness. So on the one hand, people with mental health problems are widely believed to be unwell because of social and environmental factors, and that the treatment should be better social support from friends, family, and the community. And on the other hand, people with mental health problems are also believed to be dangerous, unpredictable, have the potential for enacting violence and are therefore unsuited to work and other social roles. And this belief is coupled conversely with a reluctance for closeness or intimacy or anything particularly social. And this is a really important finding, I would say. But because uh, the Glasgow Media Group's analysis uh, does little to make sense of this ambivalence, um, we need to push it further. And I would say that the reason that they don't manage to deal with this ambivalence is they um, classify one as positive and the other as negative. So the, the first one that it, a social explanation is a positive one and people are sympathetic. And then also the second is a negative one and people are scared. They've, they instate a binary there. 
So moving on, what do we do? How do we make sense of that? Um, the work that has informed contemporary anti-stigma campaigns, they, uh, one of the key problems is that they obscure how psychiatry and psychology, their knowledge and their practices, and national mental health policy and law are strongly implicated in the stigmatization of madness and distress. And it's done by diverting our attention to media representations. They begin and end with the media in their analyses. To better understand how the conflation of mental illness and violence is achieved, legitimated and widely circulated, I draw here on cultural theorist Stuart Hall's work on, to develop an understanding of the relations of reciprocity between these primary definers and the media. In her article, Making Bipolar Brittany, Proliferating Psychiatric Diagnoses Through Tabloid Media, Gigi and Veronica traces the relationship between the mental health system and media producers. Using the story of pop star Britney Spears' accrual of a diagnosis of bipolar disorder, and um, hopefully there are some people here old enough to remember when Britney shaved her hair and everyone was aghast. Um, so Veronica deals with this uh, period in Britney's uh, life and shows how the tabloid press draws upon psi expertise to narrate Spears' descent into madness in a way that reasserts the validity of psychiatric discourse. Because psychiatry sits on a precarious credibility, Veronica argues, it depends on constant relegitimation in order to hold stable its assertions that madness is a problem of science and disease. Britney Spears' public breakdown, her receipt of a diagnosis and her ensuing treatment all serve as stories through which psi expertise can be circulated. Both stories of going mad and stories of recovery can be manipulated to serve this purpose. The logic proceeds thus. If she is ill, she must be treated. If she recovers, it is proof that the treatment works. If she does not recover, it is because she did not adhere to her treatment. The so-called facts of bipolar disorder frame Spears' life experiencing, make experiences, making them legible only in psychiatric terms. All other narratives are erased. Tasha de Brufny adds to this perspective with an analysis of TV news reporting on postpartum depression and psychosis. De Brufny argues that postpartum depression and psychosis must be domesticated to neutralize its threat to the dominant and oppressive ideals around what constitutes an essential or good motherhood in patriarchal capitalist societies. She demonstrates this is done through the reliance on psychiatric experts who speak from within a biomedical paradigm and use a white, the use of white upper class women to provide anecdotal evidence and information about postpartum disorders. Postpartum depression and psychosis must be construed as a disease or illness that are temporary and can be treated biomedically. The psychiatric experts describe and define the illness, whilst the women's stories of recovery through treatment give an authenticity to the science. Lucy Costa and her colleagues uh, in Canada, Toronto, Canada, have documented and analysed this current trend within the mental health system in Canada, in which intimate and personal stories of madness and recovery are commodified. They argue that whilst telling stories is a central part of mental health survivor user and psychiatric survivor organising and activism, um, and also is part of a long history of consciousness raising in many um, social uh, groups, activist groups. This uh, has been co-opted by powerful organisations who seek to secure access to resources by asserting their effectiveness through patient testimonies. This approach is exemplified in the Time to, time to Change campaign's advice on how to blog for them. So just highlighting two key points here is that they note that personal stories that are a, a powerful force in changing social attitudes, but they won't publish stories that are aimed at people with shared experiences of, of mental health, and they won't share stories um, about experiences of mental health treatment systems or policy. So Costa and colleagues, Dubrovni and Veronica, all demonstrate that not only do Psy discourse and media work together to reproduce power, but these medicalized representations also depoliticize, marginalize people's dissent 
um, the ways in which that dissent is brought together and articulated. And crucially, it is often through positive media reporting that this work is done. Indeed, the distinction between negative and positive representations of madness and distress is misleading. Furthermore, these representations strengthen and maintain gendered, racialized, and class norms through the conflation of the white middle class liberal individual with the ideal subject of those recovery stories. In Policing the Crisis, Mugging, the State and Law and Order, cultural theorist Stuart Hall and his co-authors detail the relationship between dominant ideologies and the everyday practices of making news. They argue that it would be inaccurate to argue that the media are in some way controlled by those with vested interests um, for our uh, purposes here with, say, psychiatry. Nonetheless, rules governing journalists and the structure of news reporting mean that the media tend faithfully and impartially to reproduce symbolically the existing structure of power in society's institutional order. In upholding the ideals of balance and impartiality and distinguishing between fact and opinion, the media strongly rely upon experts to provide their stories with credibility. Thus, those endowed with institutional expertise, in our case, psychiatrists and psychologists, are the go-to people for stories on madness and distress. They are what Hall and his co-authors co would call primary definers. When counter perspectives are sought in the name of balance, the primary definers have already set the limits of what is possible to say about that particular news item. Arguments against a primary interpretation are forced to insert themselves into its definition of what is at issue, they must begin from this framework of interpretation as their starting point. So the values of journalism entail the reproduction of dominant discourses without necessarily being explicitly controlled by those in power. The point is media are not solely responsible for stigmatizing madness and distress, but rather reproduce stigma by working in tandem with existing uh, knowledges and practices which are themselves stigmatizing. Bates and Stickley have argued that the mental health system comprising law, policy and professional practices are a form of institutionalized stigma. In their consideration of the dilemma of anti-stigma campaigns, they conclude that mental health legislation which removes a person's rights, coerces them into treatment and focuses extensively on diagnosis and risk factors may perpetuate stigma and social exclusion. Similarly, some evidence shows that medical models of madness and distress produce more negative and stigmatizing perceptions of people with mental health conditions than do social explanations. I contend that this institutionalized stigma also sets the terms through which violence perpetrated by those living with a diagnosis of mental illness will be read. Stigma, in this case the association of mental illness and violence, is integral to the ethos of mental health systems in most global North countries. In my analysis of mental health policy and law, which I have published elsewhere, I argue that these are practices of state making in which a risk of to violence is one of the key critical thresholds that determines the nation states insiders and outsiders. Stigma is a specific boundary marker that legitimates state enacted violence. For example, being sectioned, receiving forced treatment, experiencing resulting impoverishment and marginalization. Dominant debates about media representation and anti-stigma campaigns are part of these practices of state making Stigma and anti-stigma are not concerned with individuals, but rather have a political currency in producing inequalities on a national and global scale. How do we refuse the primary definers terms when we think about the relationship between madness, distress, violence and media representations? We could begin with those facts that are widely circulated. Let us take, for example, the one in four statistic that we must all now be familiar with. It is intended to make people understand that mental health and illness are facts of life, universal experiences, and to some extent, normal. What is effaced here in our current system is that who you are matters a great deal in terms of what happens to you when you experience mental health problems. For example, if you are Black or Black British in the United Kingdom, you are more likely to be detained and forcibly treated under the Mental Health Act 1983 2007. 
David Rocky Bennett is just one of many black British people who have died in mental health services after being restrained. So whilst Minnesota burns and the number 45 president declares war on his own people, let us not imagine that the UK does not also have its own structures of violent institutional racism. Representing mental health as everyone's business belies the significant inequalities inherent in that current system. Institutionalized stigma for some, more than others, is a matter of life and death. Similarly, if we begin to unpick the claim that people with severe mental illnesses are more likely to be victims rather than perpetrators of violent crime, we also encounter problems. The anti-stigma statistic about violence is offered as a reassurance for the members of for members of the public. It tells them that they are safe. The statistic is not a call to action around the inequalities of the violent victimization of mad identified people. This fact does not does important work in silencing such questions with the promise that once we understand the facts of mental illness, stigma will be eradicated. It also conflates violence with violent crime, again drawing our attention away from structural and state enacted violence, enforcing a divisive logic through a cultural economy of fear. So what might anti-anti-stigma look like? This excerpt is an article from Asylum magazine reflecting on a trip some members took to Toronto, Canada uh, to collaborate with Sight Survivor Movement there. After taking part in the Hands Off Our Stories event, which I cited earlier, which is the cost of Lucy Costa et al's article, the group reflected that we realise that we aren't the only people fed up with all the mental health anti-stigma campaigns. These campaigns are becoming globalised. They tend to reinforce certain established ideas about mental illness being an illness like any other and the need for medical treatment. In other words, these campaigns are far from being mad positive. Instead of a relentless focus on stigma, it might be better to focus on discrimination, human rights and alternatives. Some of us decided that we needed an anti-anti-stigma campaign. In light of the success of Hands Off Our Stories, we thought of calling it Hands Off Our Stigma. And here we can see um, uh, an anti-anti-stigma treatment of an anti-stigma campaign. So it's a move from self-improvement to structural improvements from individual suffering to people surviving the system together and a move from stopping the stigma to stop sucking off the stigma. This refers to what Costa et al call patient porn, the patient porn of the recovery story and its use to secure cultural and financial capital for those already in power. Uh, the exploitation of patient testimonies delivered for a non-mad audience, which always end in a particular way. And that's, that's me. <laughs>